but the one that I, the, the absolute nonsense one, is this idea of the money multiplier model. And I want to show why it's wrong, and we'll finish on that note and carry on next week. Okay, and what that model says the central banks have some re required reserve ratio, which is 10% in the states. So I'll show you how limited that is in a couple of weeks' time. So the argument is the central bank creates base money. So the change in reserves is $100 by I mean, some new person becomes un unemployed, so they get a check for 100 That person deposits $100 in a bank. The bank hangs on to 10 lends out 90 Borrower deposits 90 in another bank. That bank lends out 81 On you go, and ultimately that's supposed to create $1,000 out of the 100 That's the basic argument. And it's clearly something the majority of economists believe, despite their attempts to weasel out of saying that they do. And Cullen Roach did a lovely job here. I do recommend picking on this one. Um, uh, Cullen Roach is a financial person who's got a strong post-Keynesian flavour to him and knows what he's talking about. So this is the thing called pragmatic capitalist. And he went through finding all these quotes where Simon Wren Lewis, who's actually one of the pretty reasonable neoclassicals in England, um, and obviously he's on the Labour Party committee as well. And Simon Wren Lewis said, oh, you know, we all know it's a myth. Well, then what Crow Cullen does here is go through quote after quote after quote of leading economists where they're quoting the money multiplier model. And I'll just do a few of those. So you get um, Bernanke just to find QE back in 2009. And he says, currency reserves together the monetary base. As reserves grow, the monetary base grows as well. And then he says, because banks are reluctant to lend, growth in the broad measures hasn't led to growth in the base. They've been driven by growth in the base. Large increases of bank reserves are a, are a feature of quantitative easing, and the idea behind easing is that to provide banks with substantial excess liquidity in the hope that they will choose to use some part of that liquidity to make loans. So that they can use the loans, they can use the reserves to lend. And it says, as the recover economy recovers, banks should find it profitable to be more aggressive in lending. Yeah, tell me about it. And then he worried about leaving QE. What's going to happen when we leave QE? He says, well, when we um, create reserves, they turn up in, in the accounts that these reserves have at the Fed. As the economy recovers, banks should find more opportunities to lend out their reserves. OK, seriously believes it. And argues if we don't do anything about it, we're going to have massive inflation, which is the type of nonsense you can find on the web all the time. And even Joe Stiglitz, who's, I think, a lot better economist than, than Bernanke, and uh, obviously more progressive as well. Um, he's saying that the Fed should have been penalising banks for holding excess reserves. This is crap. It's just crap. And it's about time we treated it with the respect it deserves, which is none whatsoever. Banks cannot lend out reserves. And I want to show an accounting sense why that's true. So let's add a reserve. And I'll go back to the movie I've got here and show it instead here. Let's take a look at that. So I've got a faster machine back at home than this one. So we just expanding this out so you can see the operation. Add the new column, type in reserves, give a value to it. I distributed this between uh, the firm sector and the workers, I think. Okay, that's all consistent. That's that bit. Having done that, now try to show lending from reserves. This is where the accounting convention has been incredibly useful and why economists <coughs> need to learn some accounting. So I'm going to have, you want to have a, a loan, you know, put a loan in here. So, okay, let's go lend from reserves. Okay. There's a minus, okay. I've got to put a plus on the other side. But lend from reserves means you hand the money reserves out. So I've got to type minus reserves. I can't create reserves for a loan. Notice what Minsky now tells me. I've got a stock. I've got a. The, the table doesn't sum. It doesn't sum to zero. It's physically impossible to lend from the reserves. Even if you have borrowing of excess reserves and lend from those as a liability, when you record the loan, that disappears as well. It's simply physically impossible to. Lend from reserves. Yeah. They really think that. That's so because they don't have any accounting knowledge in their heads, and they learned this childish model in first year economics about the money multiplier. They still think that determines lending. And I'm, I'm, I'm one of my. Uh, I actually met the guys in the Big Short about five years ago, and um, and went out for dinner with one of them and his girlfriend. 
and a uh, girlfriend told me that she had, I think it was either her or her, I think her, fr- her best friend, was working in, in the central bank as a consultant for a while and had this accounting background. And Vanenke actually grilled her over dinner one day. How did they actually do the lending? Okay, so Vanenke just accepts the textbook model that he's got. He hasn't actually asked banks, is that phys- physically possible? That's why I'm so, you know, I'm such a fan of the Bank of England because they've come out and said you can't lend from reserves. Okay? But I want to show you in, a conven- in accounting convention terms why you can't because if you put this in the, the way that accountants want, the credit and debit uh, format, then if you're going to have a, a loan being done by an accountant, you're going to have a debit on the asset side for the loan and a credit for the repayment. Okay, it's just it's more confusing than I think the plus minus thing. But if I do it that way and I show it this way, then to try to show lending from reserves, which means reserves are, 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 are falling, then I, I get an inconsistency here. So this, if I show lending by the firms itself, that's correct. I just to go back again, I've got a debit here and a debit there, which is what the accounting convention requires, and that shows a loan coming out. When I've got the repayment down, I've got a credit here and a credit there. That's what the accounting convention requires. When I do what the economists think happen, I've got a credit on one side and a debit on the other, and that breaks the fundamental law of accounting. Okay. So it's simply an accounting error to believe you can do it. And this, um, you know, as I've argued when I started talking about thermodynamics in the first lecture, you can't reduce economics to thermodynamics. But if you have a theory that involves breaching the laws of thermodynamics, you haven't got a theory at all. Okay. And equally, if you have a theory of lending that breaches uh, how lending actually can be done by the banks, you haven't got a theory of economics either. The activity simply can't happen. So you don't need to discuss it beyond saying oh, it's physically, accountingly impossible to do that. It's just nonsense. The money multiply model is a load of crap. Let's get rid of it. Reserves play no direct role on lending. It's just there to centre interbank, inter, interbank accounts. So if you look at that three-sided transaction bank, uh, that Grazioni goes through, if you have an interbank transaction, again, I've shown you this earlier, You've got the buyer with the bank, a buyer who's in bank banks with bank A. You want to make, you want to buy things from somebody who banks with bank B. You need a central bank to enable the transfer of reserves to enable that to happen. That's the role that reserves play. And if you show this in Minsky, then here's Minsky now showing a three, a three-tiered arrangement. So I've got private bank, central bank, two private banks, and one central bank. And when you put it together in accounts. If you're going to buy widgets off somebody, you, you bank. Here, here's somebody banking at Barclays who um, wants to buy buy widgets. Hang on. So the buyers, sorry, the buyers down here. There's HSCB person buying in HSCB. Hang on. Wait, wait. Now buying is over. This is the buyer. So the buyer wants to buy, which means the reserves of Bar- go out of Barclays and go across to HSBC. So that's the buyer. The seller sees this happen. The reserves of the HSBC rise, and so do the deposits of the seller. And there's a transfer of reserves from Barclays to HSBC. That's that's the role that reserves have. So that transfer requires that transfer. So to show something properly, you've got to show it four times, which again is something Minsky said way way back. So Minsky knew he's accounting. So that's what the central bank's role is, and that's what reserves actually do. They are not there to create money. They are there to enable transfers of reserves between banks because of interbank operations. So I'm going to finish with this little slide here and just point the point, what on earth is going on in the world if people who believe models like this, which are nonsense, are running the whole show? And I reckon this guy got it right a long time, almost right. Because he's slightly wrong. Okay, It's not true. We're in the hands of lots of lunatics. Okay? Zombie idea.